all, I'm really delighted to see so many different areas of expertise here, and also friends reaching outwards. Um, and I'm hoping you'll give me feedback that I can use to finish my book. Uh, tell you, I, I think the best way to talk about it today, I'm going to warn you, uh, I do PowerPoint the way that they warn you not to do PowerPoint. <laughs> and I keep thinking I'm going to take the time and do it properly. And, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've had headless people in my PowerPoint. This time I did get the head in. I'll show you which one was headless before. Uh, but I, you'll see some awkward stuff. So what I want, thought I would do is uh, talk about the big picture of the project and then do a little more focused presentation on this particular order because Jim thought this might be of interest uh, across our different uh, regional, in terms of regional engagement. And you let me know what you think. Uh, so this topic actually comes out of a, a bigger project on the Holy Land, and specifically Catholic engagement in the Holy Land. Whoa. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, by the way, okay, that. <laughs> by the way, any design element, you know they have an automatic design function? I just discovered it this week. It's <laughs> dangerous, so it's getting a little wonky, but just accept it that I just, you know. <laughs> so, so it actually came out, uh, I know that you, that you know part of the purpose of the seminar is to talk about how we create projects and how we move on to new projects. And my first project was a, a narrowly focused study of the religious and political engagement of Franciscan preachers in Paris in the wars of religion. Uh, and what happened during that project was that you know, I started encountering these very interesting documents in there on the, this confraternity of the Holy Sepulchre which was attached to the Grand Poupon. And I, these documents were fascinating, and it turned out that these men, at first I wasn't sure they actually made it to the Holy Land, it turns out a lot of them had actually gone to the Holy Land as pilgrims. But then when I started looking at it, I, re I discovered this really, really strong connection between the observant Franciscans and uh, this, this confraternity, uh, and that what became actually quite a big project in itself. It's only one part of my book. I'm going to explain more about the book. But in terms of getting to this book, I've literally followed these French pilgrims and French Franciscans to Rome. I was in Rome doing other research that um, on my friends uh, wrapping up the book, and I went to the archives of the Propaganda Fide. Has anyone, um, does anyone know the archives of the missions of the Propaganda Fide in Rome? Jacob, you yeah. might end up knowing it. Yeah. It's a fantastic resource. I highly recommend the ind indices are non-existent virtually. It is this voluminous archive, it's extraordinary, um, not just useful for missions, it's for understanding. These are reports from all over the world where the Catholic Church is engaging. It was founded in 1622, and its purpose, the congregation, was to essentially help reconstruct papal authority globally. It was to reclaim missions lost to France, I mean, to, well, to France as well, but to, especially to Spain and Portugal, but also ecclesiastical uh, institutions that had long existed in the Levant and other areas, but which were really independent. And so, so, so I went to Rome, found these incredible archives, found all these volumes on the Holy Land, and my friars were there. I had friars. I had so many friars. And I was so excited, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be spending the rest of my life working on Franciscans. And it's, I think it's going to be the case. So what, so what happened was that when I got into those records, I realized I was dealing with a, uh, an institution that was global. So. What the project is, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty, is first of all, it's become, the book project is five chapters. What I'm doing is exploring uh, Catholic engagement in the Holy Land at a time of profound religious and political change. What I discovered is this very interesting historical synchronicity of changes that intersected, that I think were formative, and made the Holy Land a much more important place to go as a Catholic power, a Catholic community, for certain Catholics. So the first, obviously, was uh, December 1516, uh, the Ottoman conquest of the Holy Land. Uh, this is the, the Ottomans were swept in and took over the Mammoth Empire, as a lot of you probably know. Obviously, 1517 is a pledgy date for the Renaissance, but uh, for the Reformation, but I'm using it anyway because I think it's interesting that a few months later we have Martin Luther posting the 95 Theses, uh, just in terms of shaping the world of the friars and the Catholics that are going there. And thirdly, <coughs> for my friars in particular, very interesting that in 1517 we have the formal division of the order into two um, two important, still still very important uh, branches, the conventional and the observants. Um, shortly thereafter, we have the Capuchins emerges a third branch. Uh, but what also is interesting to me, and because of the Holy Land, 
is that the observant branch is still fissuring throughout this period. And they are, we find that the custody of the Holy Land, which I'll talk about just shortly, uh, becomes the site of conflict between members of the Observer Franciscans who are trying to claim the jurisdiction. So, so this is a very, very big picture. The fourth is not on this list. It doesn't fit my time frame uh, perfectly, which is why it's not there, but I want to keep in mind uh, these new empires that are forming. And the Mediterranean, and the place that <coughs> and its importance involving France, Spain, and still Venice. Uh, so I guess the point I'm trying to make, first of all, it's a bit of a big project. But I think what helps keep it focused and doable, I've been spending, by the way, uh, over a decade doing research on this and trying to write it up for the last couple of years because it's taken me intellectually a lot to figure out what's going on with it. Uh, but what I think is very important, what keeps it focused for me is that I'm focusing on the Franciscans who run it. So they're my uh, locus for investigating, for looking outward at Catholic engagement. And I'll introduce them shortly. So as you can see, I've cut off the first chapter. What I, Essentially, each chapter I've organized as a some kind of conflict involving or challenge threat to my Franciscans who are in charge of the custody from other Christians. Uh, and it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to paint them as victims. I'm just trying to, these are just five areas and arenas of conflict. The first has to do with the Greek Orthodox over altars, which I talk about as triggered by the Ottoman conquest. And that is getting into a discussion of the Holy Land <coughs> The second is the one I'm going to be presenting on today, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is really a group that I think is interesting for examining Protestant challenges to the Great Pilgrimage. Uh, the third uh, uh, is on French engagement in the region. And this is, there's, um, that's a, that was an enormous project in itself and could be a whole book. I uh, was <laughs> working on that. But it, they assume the right, that under the Bourbons, the role of protector of the Holy Land. You're smiling, so I think you know. Do you know, and you work in immigration though, right? Do you know? Yeah, just some church history in my background. Okay, so, <laughs> really, uh, well, so anyway, so I talk about uh, as of 16 to 4, but really I take it all back to uh, the, to the wars of religion. For me, the wars of religion are crucial for understanding French engagement. Uh, maybe because I worked on the wars of religion, it's always going to be the most important thing to determine French engagement in the 17th century. But that's how I argue in the book. The fourth is on the pap papal involvement. Uh, what I'm arguing both in the case of France and the papacy is that for both these powers, the Holy Land becomes a jur exercise of jurisdiction of the Holy Land becomes important for constructing themselves as hegemonic powers, mm -hmm. and, and specifically in terms of Christian hegemony in different ways. But again, they're both trying to reconstitute their their claims to authority in response to the profound changes in the 16th century. I hope I'm not losing any. Uh, finally, the final one is when I talk about my Franciscan conflicts. And this is where I'd like to introduce the custody itself. Does anyone, has anyone been to Jerusalem here? Okay. So, you probably already know. Oh, here's my argument, sorry. <laughs> big, big argument. And then I promise, oh, and I missed out the custody. Oh, okay. All right. So, this is the big argument, and then I've got three broad observations. And then I'm going to come to my, my little project, and then you can tell me what you think. So, in terms of the argument, I argue the disputes in the, in the custody um, argue a rep a reflect the reification of the Holy Land as a tangible and powerful vessel of Christian authority, and thus a source of legitimacy for an embattled Catholic tradition. Okay, that's the big picture. Second, which is related to it, and this is where my custody is so important, as an institution. And those of you working in the Islamic context will understand where I'm going. Um, I think it illuminates at the same time a critical role for my custody as a gatekeeper to the legitimizing authority of the Holy Land because of its distinctive hybrid identity for the Catholic and the Islamic institution. Some people like the term Islamic. I, I tend to keep it a little bit separate because I'm trying to make a point, but really we're talking about I think, a similar idea. So far so good? Okay. My custody. I've got pictures coming. I promise pictures. So the, what is the custody of the Holy Land? Well, if you've been to Jerusalem, you may have not already seen it. Certainly if you went to the Holy Sepulchre, you'll see the signs of them everywhere. The custody is a, an ecclesiastical jurisdiction, which was established in 1343 through negotiations between the kings and queen of Naples, my Franciscans, who are already present, and the uh, Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, Nur al-Din. So therefore, it's a legal construct. It is an ecclesiastical jurisdiction. It is both from the start uh, supported by papal and Islamic law. 
And it gets much more complicated than that, but that's what we need to understand. Second, since 1342, since it was founded, the Franciscan order has been in charge, and it's still in charge to this day. So that's almost, I can't figure out the math, at least 700 years, right? Am I doing 700 years? Am I more? I can't, is that terrible? My brain's not working. A long time. They've been there a long time. Uh, the observants have been in charge since 1431. Uh, what are their responsibilities? Their responsibility has always been that the whole purpose of establishing it was to uh, uh, manage Western pilgrimage. Uh, and so their job involves literally, if you go to visit there, <coughs> or to a Catholic pilgrimage, they will take you on a tour of the sites. It's very professional today. I don't know if you've checked it. If you ever want to book a tour, want to do the pilgrimage, they know what they're doing, the Franciscans. They're very good at doing package tours. They've had lots of experience. Uh, but they're also involved in my period and to this day. Very important for them, the acquisition of new altars and holy places, protection of the existing ones that they have, and that includes also the renovation and ornamentation of spaces. Okay? The whole point is promoting this as a pilgrimage destination. It's very important, I want to emphasize through all this, and, I'm gonna, and it's going to seem really obvious, but it's important uh, to what I'm in the book. It's important to be there. I even put in italics. Because one of the arguments in sacred space these days that I do agree with, but I think doesn't really um, fully capture the importance of sacred spaces, and especially something like the Holy Land, is the idea that the Holy Land um, became mobile, so it was less important to go. Uh, and pilgrimage did decline, because for other reasons. But I'm arguing that actually it was very important to have a Catholic presence there. Uh, for reasons that I'll get into. Okay, and then finally, uh, the one thing to realize, what is its jurisdiction? It covers uh, the holy places, which are Christian shrines that the, the Franciscans have access to. Uh, they don't have the access. They, at this time, they didn't have access to all of them, but they had access to uh, some of the most important uh, that are across Palestine, uh, Egypt, and Syria. Uh, the most important, of course, in and around Jerusalem. Uh, the most important ones. Those of you who've been, what are the? I'll, I'll this. Is, I'm going to do my teaching moment. What are some of the most important holy places? The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Why is that important? For obvious reasons, it's the burial site. Crucifixion and resurrection burial. and burial and all the important moments. Anywhere else that's important? I can't believe I'm doing this to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell? I just have a secondary class that's doing something really good. Uh, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. The Cenacle, which is the second last supper, uh, which is in Jerusalem, which is also the tomb of David, according to the Jewish traditions. We have some sharing of so the heat was headless the last time I did this. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I did that, because if you see, it's pretty low, actually. This is Patri Christophero, who is my Franciscan. Uh, this is the archives in the Custody of the Holy Sepulchre, which is in the Church of the Holy Savior. Uh, this is the church that they've occupied since 1558. Uh, they lived at one on, the, on Mount Sinai, right beside the Seneca, until uh, 1551, until it was taken over uh, by Ottoman, uh, by the Ottomans and turned into a mosque. So uh, in this period, they, weren't, they were able to get special access to go, but pilgrims couldn't go. And they were forced out and had to get a new convent. Um, so anyway, he was in charge of me. And, and in terms of, because this is a, a sort of research seminar, I thought you might want to know a little bit about what's involved in terms of doing the research on this project. Uh, well, it dis I discovered much to my chagrin when I got into it that the actual archives of the custody were um, largely lost during the Resurgement. And because this is a Jesuit college, I think you'll really appreciate this. In the 18th century, the Franciscan head at the Church of Araceli in Rome, which is this magnificent church, if you have a chance to visit, who was the head of the whole order, decided that he was going to imitate the Jesuits and create a, uh, you know, a, a, a single arc, a single you know, central archive. And so he called, they sent out a call to all the Franciscan communities who were and, and certainly the custody got a call to send all their documents. So they sent them to Rome. They kept ferments, they kept other things that were important, but actually the, most of the archives went to Rome. And uh, during the Resonimento, Araceli was, uh, was attacked and its archives mostly destroyed. Apparently there's stuff there, but it hasn't been apparently uh, properly organized. <coughs> uh, certainly no one's getting access to them. So to do this kind of project, you have to go out. This is an international institution anyway. It's a global institution. I'll explain why. Uh, it belongs to all of the Catholic Church. The Franciscans come from inter um, international communities, mostly Italian, 
French and Spanish, but they come from across the Franciscan provinces, and that's for a lot of reasons. Uh, and because it's also pilgrimage, you have to have multiple languages. So there are ideological reasons as well as practical reasons for them. But what's important here is that for me to find them, I have to go find who they engaged with to a large extent. I did find some stuff in the archives, but mostly I've had to go uh, to archives in, um, well, a lot of it I've uh, gone to use the bio records in Venice quite extensively, Rome extensively in the Congregation of Propaganda Theory, but that only begins in 1622. Bio, again, you know, Spain, um, Semencus, uh, Seville, uh, losing track. Where else have I gone? France, obviously. So, the point about this kind of project is you have to kind of prepare yourself that depending on what you want to do with it, the archives are there, but you're going to have to go out and find them. And it's, and it, and it's exciting. It's really exciting to do it. It's exhausting. It takes a lot, a lot of time to do it. But I, you find some very interesting connections. Okay? So, let's see if I'm still doing this right. Okay. So I just want to give you a couple of, I'm getting into the, um, the cousins. What did I say about the Franciscans here? On average, just to introduce them before I get into the rites, I just want to mention, this is the Via Dolorosa. It's a terrible image, I know. Um, let's see, do I have another one? Okay, there's the Holy Sepulchre, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, if, you, if, the, if you haven't been to Jerusalem, the thing to realize is the old city is very, very crowded. It's a very, uh, uh, very, very densely populated city. Uh, in this period, I think we have at least 21 Christian churches alone in the city. Uh, but then they include the mosques, the, um, the Jewish temples, and so forth. So it's a very, very vibrant um, city in this period. And this is an enormous structure. It's very hard to convey. Uh, it covers this as the most important sites of the, um, the uh, crucifixion resurrection as mentioned. So this is fuzzy. I apologize. Um, what I want to point out, actually, was this symbol, which you can't make out here, but I'm going to show you a better uh, picture. I just want to point out, because this is the Via Dolorosa, here you've got the sign, so you know where you're going. It's a very well-marked geography. It's intentionally so. The Franciscans help to choreograph this geography. They're the ones who introduce the Stations of the Cross. And if you go to Jerusalem, they're marked. So here's Station 1, here in the House of Pilate, here's so 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 here we've got the symbols. Now, this is the Jerusalem Cross, which is going to be important to our discussion of this order. It's the emblem of the order. The symbols here, one arm is Jesus, one arm is Francis of Assisi. So they're marking the city with the Franciscan, with the Franciscan spiritual authority. This is the symbol. This is the emblem of the custody. So here's here's Saint Francis's arm. Uh, I'm sure you all know, but if you don't, Francis um, received the stigmata. He, so he's considered the other Christ. And so this is a, just a wonderful symbol of Jesus, uh, of Francis, essentially being the other Christ who's carrying on the mission of Christ. Uh, so the the, Franc the Franciscans know how to market themselves, I think, quite effectively. Uh, this is the, the chapel of the apparition. The reason why I'm showing you, this is a modern day cha the chapel. Uh, this is in the Basilica of the Holy Supper. This is where every procession started in, my, in our period we're talking about, right back to the Middle Ages. It's under Franciscan jurisdiction. In the Basilica, six different <coughs> Christian traditions have jurisdiction over different chapels. It goes right back to Mamluk times. It's a legal issue. It's very interesting. Uh, but the Franciscans have... I think four chapter, chapters in this period. It depends on when you, there is what conflict over them. And the, right now, they have at least three under their authority, as I recall. This is the starting point for any procession, so it's uh, of interest to me. Uh, this is the Station 11. Uh, this is the Chapel of the Crucifixion. Um, I'm showing it here. Obviously, it's a very, very important site. But I just, you can barely see it, unfortunately, but there are three crosses. I'm going to be returning to another <laughs> image of this later on with one of our knights. So I'm trying to be relevant. I'm not, and sometimes it sort of gets hard to stop. And here it is. OK, so this is where my talk begins. And I'm not going to read a formal paper, because I, I was saying to Mac, I started to read my paper, and I realized I was not interested in what I had to say. So I'm hoping that this will be a more relaxed discussion, and that anything that I miss, or that we can bring up the discussion. What I found very interesting is that the order that I'm finding in these records, and I'm just going to read the introduction shortly so you know where I'm going, still exists to this day. And so I wanted you to see pictures. Uh, they have a massive house just inside the walls of the Vatican, uh, in Vatican City. Uh, this is their robes. Uh, what's interesting is that women now can join. Obviously, at the time, they couldn't. Uh, so we have dames as well as uh, knights. Uh, and, but the, what's interesting is this robe. We actually find a version of it in the 16th century. 
Now, they're not all wearing it. It's very irregular, but we do have it. And then this is formalized in 1907. Uh, but what I want to point out is the Jerusalem cross, which is a very important symbol. That becomes sort of the, the symbol of the order. Okay, so now I'm just, what I'd like to do, if this is okay, just so I can be as clear as possible about my argument here, is just read out the first, uh, intro, just read out my introduction, and then I'm just going to take it from there, because that will keep me clear. Because what I want to do is describe the ritual of the naming. And I keep coming back to it, so I want to have all the elements there. So it was on the feast day, so this is a knight from 1562, um, I'm forgetting his name, is that German? Uh, German knight, I just wanted to point out, I'll be coming back to him shortly, but I don't know who he is, but it's a good picture. So it was on the feast day of the, pur uh, the purification in November 1617 that the French pilgrim Nicole Bernard became a knight of the Holy Sepulchre. As was customary on the Holy Land pilgrimage, the pilgrims had spent the previous night locked in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. After several hours passed in intense devotion, Bernard and the other pilgrims went to sleep. According to his detailed account, it was around 6 a.m. that the Franciscan Custos approached him in secret and asked him to join a procession. Bernard and another would-be uh, would, um, would knight named Bristol uh, made their way to the chapel, of the, to the, uh, the site of Christ's resting space, so the sepulchre, which is the, the most sacred part of the, the whole basilica. Once inside, the door was closed, and Bernard and, and Restaux uh, prostrated themselves, bareheaded before the Franciscan Custos. The Custos is the head of the Franciscan order. He has Episcopal authority, so he's a very powerful office. He was the most powerful ecclesiastical authority in all of the, the, um, the, the custody of the Holy Land, but that makes Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. So he's a very important official. Over the course of the subsequent ceremony, the two men were interrogated on their worthiness to join the venerable community. What was their state and condition? Were they of noble or base background? Could they support themselves as knights if called to do so? And would they dedicate themselves to the protection of the Holy Sepulchre? After giving the oath to observe the statutes of this noble and holy order of knights, the Franciscan Custos then took the sword once held by Godfrey Brio and tapped the shoulders of first Bernard and then Nesto. The ritual continued on from there as the two newly created chevaliers were dressed with the gold chain, golden spurs that marked their new identity, listened to his speech on the responsibilities, exchanged kisses with the friars, and joined in the traditional rites of prayers, hymns, and so forth, before processing back to join the other pilgrims at the chapel of the apparition. So Bernard's description of the ritual knighting is one of several we have dating from the early modern period. Most of these come from fellow members of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, who, like Bernard, wrote and published accounts of their pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Several, and I should also mention, several also included lengthy pilgrimage accounts in their regular travel accounts. So we have actually many more texts. Several of the Franciscan Brothers of the Holy Land included descriptions of the knighting as well in their own writings. So taken together, these treatises, I'm going to argue, provide compelling evidence of a close relationship between the custody of the Holy Land and the confraternity throughout the medieval and early modern periods. One that was a relationship that was forged out of a shared devotion to the Holy Land and a desire to protect it. But more than that, the inclusion of the descriptions of the writing, uh, the knighting ritual should be read, I'm going to argue, as claims to spiritual leadership, one embodied in the knighting ritual constructed at the nexus of the Holy Land pilgrimage, a crusading past, and a formative relationship with the observant brothers of the Holy Land. Just to be more precise here, what do I mean by this? It was meaningful to Bernard that his transformation took place at the foot of Christ's sepulchre during the rite of pilgrimage with the sword of God for Rio and through the officiation of Franciscan Custos. I'm coming back to all of those elements later, but I want to emphasize that this ritual significance was embedded with layers of meaning. All right, so who are the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre? Do I have any, let's see. Well, here's one, obviously. Um, as you can see, he's not wearing the right robe, but I want to point out he's got the uh, insignia of the order. Uh, which is the cross of Jerusalem. He's wearing also, um, he's also included the blazon uh, up here in his portrait. This is very, very common. I have lots of material evidence on this. So it's a very important identity to the Knights. So this is an order that actually does have a long history, but it's, um, it's a complicated one. Uh, essentially, the, uh, what records we have is that there was an order of the Holy Sabbath Order right during the period of Crusader Jerusalem. It's not clear that the Knights that I'm talking about actually came from that. Uh, what does seem clear is that there were multiple associations called orders of the Holy Sepulchre in the, in the 12th century, uh, starting the 11th century, and that sometime after 1291, we start to <coughs> see a confraternity emerge, uh, a, cru a crusading pilgrimage confraternity, which also had this name. It could be connected, but it's not, we can't automatically say that it is. <coughs> 
this, oh, I just get it. Uh, what I find very interesting about this confraternity, just so you know the history, it has its own mythic past. It dates its formation to Godfrey of Bouillon, who was a crusader um, ruler of Jerusalem, as you know. And the argument was that they were uh, constructed to protect the Holy Sepulchre, so they were a chivalric order. Uh, all of the, the histories written by members of the, the order, we've got lots of histories written in the 19th century in particular, and a very good one that I've used extensively by Jean Dugène, who's a present day member of the order. It's a wonderful, I think three, I think it's three volumes, I just use uh, one and a half of it, uh, that talks about the entire history of the order, and takes it right back. And he's quite skeptical about the early crusading origins. But what's interesting is that mythic history is very important for our early modern knights. What's also important about these knights is that, uh, to my purposes, why I find them interesting. Uh, I find them interesting for a lot of reasons. First of all, they're everywhere in the pilgrimage records of the custody. They are a visible face of the pilgrimage, and they've received so little attention. Uh, there are, uh, they, we have uh, knights who are, they have to come to Jerusalem to be knighted. They have to do it during the pilgrimage. It's the only time they can do it in the period. And they come from all over the Catholic tradition. Uh, up until the beginning of the 16th century, we have a lot of Germans. The Reformation really takes a blow. We still have Germans after, but we do see uh, increasingly what's going to happen is it's going to shift. And the majority will shift from being mostly German to actually mostly French uh, by the end of the 16th and 17th century for reasons that are in Chapter 3 that I'm happy to talk about. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this order, what's interesting to me is that you've got an international body of, of members. Uh, it's based on the pilgrimage rite. They all come to Jerusalem. It's the only way they can join the order. And they're, they're uh, very visible in the fabric of the custody. The notarial records, they're giving alms, they're giving ornaments. They also mark themselves. They're very visible. The, this, this identity of the knights uh, makes it easy to some exceptions, it's easy to track them. But it was a very important badge because it, had, it was considered a recognizable civil rig, chivalric order in that it was papally recognized by this period, and it also uh, came with, you know, ostensibly the privileges that noble um, chivalric orders had. So it was very popular. So what I find interesting is that there's a lot of textual evidence, a lot of material evidence, that this order existed, it was vibrant throughout the early modern period as well as in the medieval period. Uh, we estimate that uh, on average it was only 3.5 that Jean de Gennes said were, were created a year during the early modern period. But what it meant is that some years you'd have you know, 15, 20, and other years you wouldn't you know, have any or you'd have one or two, so it averaged out. From what I can see based on the registry of knights that it was started in 1566, it seems pretty steady. Um, it seems about the same, so it doesn't fundamentally change period. But it's a very interesting collection of men who um, come from uh, different social backgrounds. There are a lot of members of the nobility, but there are also uh, clearly some well-to-do merchants. Uh, we've got a couple of clerics by the end of the period. So here's, it is, this is one Carlo Maggi, who's a Venetian. So why haven't they been studied? And I've heard a lot of theories about this. And I, and I think one of them is that, uh, I think the assumption uh, by scholars, and, and for understandable reasons, is that many people who joined this order simply wanted the knighthood, right? That, and, and I think that's true. I think a lot of people just wanted the knighthood. Uh, it came with privileges that were completely unenforceable. <laughs> I mean, there are freedom from taxes, you need to see them. Uh, but, but, the, but it had, it was something they could have, they had certain privileges that were valuable. You could include the ensign, yeah, the, the ensign in your armorial, so that was part of the construction of noble identity. Uh, but I also, I'm going to suggest that it also had spiritual value for many members as well. And so, I, I, the, the, the knights I'm going to be talking about actually left pretty extensive material traces behind, to my mind, that show that they were very devout men, many of them. So we have a lot of members who probably just went for the knighting ritual, and that really was the end of their conception of the order. But the, well, the knights I'm going to be talking about here, I'm going to argue, invested a great deal of meaning into being a knight for religious reasons, and, and considered it a spiritual idea that, uh, ideal that was um, formative. Okay. So what kind of evidence do I have? Well, first of all, 
Uh, I'm using Carlo Maggi to begin with because he has this beautiful book. This is a manuscript, but it's an engraved manuscript uh, that was clearly widely circulated in his time. He was a Venetian citizen. He traveled widely to 1568-73. Uh, he was captured by pirates. I mean, he had the whole Mediterranean experience. Uh, but, and he also did the pilgrimage. So right? he sort of wrapped up a lot of things there just by doing that. Uh, what I find very interesting is that he's a particularly colorful example of self-marking of being a knight. And, uh, and here are some of the, the signs. And this is why I'm going to suggest we can't just see it as a chivalric, uh, a desire for some of these men had devotional significance. So he does have here, this is the chain. When you get the description of the ritual I gave, one of the things you're going to get, one of the most important things is simple as that chain uh, with the insignia of the Jerusalem cross. What he's also done in his book, it's called the Codex Magi. It's, it's a, it's a, really, this is his, this is his blazon. This is the, his armorial. So here we have the Jerusalem cross. This is actually stunning, isn't it? Most of the time it's, it's, it's not as beautifully rendered in these, in these things, but this is stunning. Uh, and he, so here is his family's crest, and here he's incorporated, which is they're legally allowed to do once you join the order. So this is in a book in which he also includes an image, this is his visit of the holy places. So he has all these beautiful images. He's going other places as well. So it's not just a pilgrimage to this. But one of the most important of these um, engravings concerns the visitation of the holy places. And here he's getting knighted in the holy sepulchre. So he includes himself in here. And this is the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. I mean, it doesn't really look anything like that, actually. But this is, we know what's going on. And here, that's the Franciscan Custos. And he's now being inducted into the order. So I, I'm going to suggest this was meaningful to him. I mean, it's, it's, he's gathering it. It's a memento of his tour, but it's part of a trajectory of, of life that was meaningful. Here is the um, Jerusalem Kapel in uh, Bruges. Did anyone go to the 16th century conference in Bruges? Or Mac did, and I did. And Barbara Diefendorf and I did, and we visited the Jerusalem Kapel. And we had a very good time. What is amazing about this, I didn't get a picture of it. This is actually part of a, uh, a surviving complex in the heart of the city of the merchant. Did you go, Matt, here? No. Oh, this is, it was unbelievable. Uh, this was a church that was first, the church was built in 1429 uh, by the Adorno family, or the Adornos family. They're essentially a transplant Italian family to Bruges, so whichever name. Uh, uh, several members went to the Holy Land during the 4th and 15th century, so it's a little bit, little, I, my project really is 15 and 17 up, but they're still important because this is, I'm going to explain why. So they built the, the church in 1429, but this area right here is called the Jerusalem Capel, and that was built by Jan, uh, the son who went to the pilgrimage, I think 1470. And uh, when he came and decided to create a chapel that was a replica of the um, of the site of Golgotha in the Basilica, so the site of the crucifixion. And you get, there are three, um, here, where are the three crosses? Why can't I see them right now? Thank you. <laughs> there you go. So if the image I showed much earlier, this, the, the um, chapel of the crucifixion, it looks very different, but essentially it's the same idea. There were three crosses behind it, and that's marking the site of Christ's crucifixion and the two thieves. So here he did it in his own family church create the site of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, create one part of the Holy Sepulchre. So we call these holy place replicas. Uh, these were very common. They came all in different uh, forms throughout the medieval and early modern periods. A lot of people would uh, build replicas of the holy places and then build them in their own, in their own palace or they build them for their town. Uh, the most famous examples I can think of for the early modern period are the eight Jerusalems in the Piedmont region, in the hills of the Piedmont region, which I'm dying to visit. Uh, but there are eight Jerusalems built between uh, 1500 and 1798, I think, or something like that. Uh, the point I'm making is that it was very common and very popular to bring the Holy Land home once you went on pilgrimage. What I find so interesting, and this is part of my argument, is that not only uh, are we finding evidence that the knights were engaged in rites of personal devotion, but we find a lot of evidence that they're using their experience of going to uh, pilgrimage to promote devotion locally, beyond themselves. And this is a good example of this, because this became the seat of the Jerusalem uh, Pilgrimage Confraternity. Not the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, but many knights of the order who were based in the city joined it. So in fact, we have local confraternities that become linked to the Order of the Holy Sepulchre 
and the custody of a holy land. And so I think this is one way where you can see this is not something you just construct for yourself. This became a place where it was supposed to inspire local devotion. And it became, uh, it was visited locally, and uh, they were buried there too. A lot of the members of the, uh, the conference were buried there. So evidence so far, we have them marking themselves as members of the order. They're including images of the Holy Land as well as the order itself. They're doing replicas of the order. They're also engaged in local confraternities. Uh, that's just another upstairs. I just want to show you the Jerusalem cross. This is the order. By the time you leave here today, you're going to be so tired of seeing this cross. But this is the order. Everywhere you see the order everywhere. Uh, this is just part of the Jerusalem Capel. I find this place fascinating. This is in Seville. Has anyone been to Seville? Oh, that is one of my favorite cities. It's a little hot in the summer. Great archives. Um, but the Castle de Pilatos, have you been to the Castle de Pilatos? Yeah, Sarah's been there. Yeah. Okay. Did you know that that was the start of a new Via Crucis procession? Yeah. You knew that. So, right. or, yeah, we, you can, the guidebooks will tell you the steps so you can do your own. I went there. I don't so, I somehow I missed that. And it was only when I was doing research on him, because this was built by the Marquis of Tarifa. Uh, so he's one of the knights I'll be talking about. Uh, he went on pilgrimage in 1520. He returned, and this was his house, his plots already. He came from a very well-to-do family in uh, Seville. I mean, noble, but sort of urban nobility. Uh, what he did was renovate it. Uh, and one of the things he did was renovate it to be the House of Pilate. And now, it doesn't look anything like the House of Pilate, and not the real one, uh, not at all. But he did incorporate elements to evoke it. And he even had one called Sal the Salon of Pilate inside the room, especially dedicated to Pilate. Uh, but what I really like about this is that this became, I, I'm sorry, the images look better on my computer. Um, I'm very, very sorry. Do I have a better image? No, of course not. Uh, um, wait, hold on. Now I'm going too far. Okay, wait. Okay. How do I start it again? Uh, Chris? No, Chris is here. Okay. Sarah, do you, can you? I'm, being, I'm so Slide flustered. Show. Sure, uh, the slide show. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what my thing, though, is. Like, Oh, I see. Goes, like, That's it. Ah, of course, I'm using the wrong thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, all the way down. Pretty much. So the Casa de Pilatos, and again, I'm so sorry about the image. Um, the image is smaller than the problem. Maybe. It's funny because it looked fine on my computer, but it's now blown mm -hmm. up here. It's blown up. So, so you need high resolution. High resolution. I, I will learn at some point, <coughs> I promise. What, you can't tell here, obviously, very clearly, but up here, these are three Jerusalem uh, crosses. So this is the front door to the palace. Now, why this is important is that when Rivera came back, he renovated the palace, and he did it intentionally so that this would be the start of a new devotion, which he also introduced in the city called the, uh, via, well, the via Crucis devotion. And it goes, as, as a couple of you already know, um, from here to, I think it's the Shrine of the Santa Cruz, which is a well-known local site there. And what he did, though, was base it on the measurements that he took, gathered while he was in Jerusalem, which was very common, right? You would measure. Um, and if you had the precise measurements, then that was important for replicating the Holy Land. So we call measurements forms of replication. So his palace, um, he essentially made his palace the start of Easter devotions in Seville. And it still is to this day. So I think in terms of thinking about their role of um, the, the fact that the order invested them with the um, uh, uh, a sense of legitimacy of spiritual leaders, I think this is a pretty good example of that. Uh, this is just an image of Apollante de Rocada, one of our pilgrims, because what I want to do is in the remaining talk, and I'm just going to finish quickly uh, so that I can open up for discussion. Uh, what, do I, what do I think about this order? So if I was trying to understand um, how they understood themselves as, as, as a devotional order, what are the elements that I think are interesting? What do they tell us about them? Uh, by studying the material culture, the way they mark their, themselves, and also by looking more importantly at their pilgrimage treatises and their other writings, but especially pilgrimage treatises. Because what I found very interesting, I found about 10 pilgrimage treatises so far, about 11 that's sort of, sort of somewhere between travel count and pilgrimage treatise. Uh, they, what's very interesting about the order is that they, uh, they are one of the most prolific producers of pilgrimage treatises in the medieval and early modern periods. Uh, Dijen finds about 50 of the 350 estimated um, produced in that period between, uh, I think he's doing 1330 to 1500, uh, so 50 of those 350 he, were produced by knights. Now that ratio goes down for my period. I'm, I'm estimating in my period 15, 
20 to 50 to 1700, about 200, let's say. I've got 10, but then I've also got these other travel accounts that talk about the pilgrimage. So the genre is changing a little bit, but nonetheless, they're very important. And so they produced a lot, I think, a lot of pilgrimage treatises, but what's really interesting to me is that they, they embed their identity as knights in the treatises. It's very, very, it's palpable, their identity. And they do it so that that will uh, sort of, they draw upon that to claim expertise on the pilgrimage, right? And one of the things I argue in my book that I'm not going to talk about right now because I don't have time and I, and I will um, just take us down a different path, is that by 1520, the pilgrimage is under attack by Protestant reformers. And that's a very important, there are two elements to understanding, I think, what's going on. One is that, as I mentioned, in 1517, we have the Ottomans coming in and take over the Holy Land. So that's disruptive for my friars. But the other is that after 1517, we have the Reformation. And by 1520, we have specific attacks from Luther and others on the Holy Land pilgrimage. So not just pilgrimage, but the Holy Land pilgrimage. Uh, and there's a reason for that. I mean, the Holy Land pilgrimage was, I mean, the Holy Land was the most revered Christian uh, uh, sacred space. And so uh, what happens very quickly is that pilgrimage treatises, which are very vigorous genre, become polemics. And they're being written by Protestants as well as Catholics. And the Protestants are using this genre to debunk pilgrimage, uh, to debunk the uh, sacrality of it. Uh, by saying, I went to Jerusalem, and I, I didn't see what they're talking about. Uh, and then we've got Catholics like the Knights, who are using it to prove that Christ is there, I was transformed, and it's powerful. So it becomes, it's very interesting, one could argue that pilgrimage treatises before 1520 are devotional texts. That's the primary function. After 1520, they're also polemic, just de facto. If you're writing a pilgrimage treatise, it's going to be a polemic, whether it's Protestant or Catholic. So I think if we think about it in those terms, of these, these challenges to the Holy Land pilgrimage that are coming, a right that these men all engaged in and that was important to them. Um, and I, and, and I, I can't convey all the evidence I have on it here, but hopefully you can help draw it out if you're interested. Uh, what, I, what I find is that they start to uh, use their status as knights to, as, a, as a, a claim to expertise in these texts. And they do it in very, very interesting ways. And I just want to give a couple of examples. Uh, but it comes down to, uh, let's see, I can't remember what else I've got on here. So here are the, the ten texts I want to mention. I, d I just threw the names up there. I don't obviously expect you to know them, but I want you to at least know I have who they are. I've got five by French knights, ranging from 1534 to, uh, I think the latest is um, Bernard in 1621, which I just quoted at the start. I've got two by Italians. I've got two by Flamand. Flam Jean Zouanard is a very important text, actually published in multiple editions. Very, very interesting. Uh, he is one of the ones engaged in, in deliberate theological um, criticism with the, you know, tax with the, um, the Protestants. And then we have Don Fajique de Rivera, um, our Spanish nobleman. So these ten texts, which range over the period 1530 to, uh, I guess the latest one I've got here is 1630, uh, I find very, very interesting because if you study them collectively as well as individually, they, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre emerges as a very, very um, important religious ideal. And they do it, first of all, by introducing themselves as knights. They also uh, mention encountering other knights while traveling and also getting knighting. So they create a sense of community <coughs> amongst these knights. What I also find very interesting is that they use their texts to write their own histories. So they include uh, discussions of their, their descriptions of the ritual, which I've already talked about. They, most of them, probably the single most visible indication besides their calling themselves chevalier or, uh, or um, uh, you know, knight, whatever, is that uh, they um, all describe their nighting ritual, virtually all of them. Brethren, the Afghard does not. He just sort of mentions he's getting, uh, he's going through the ritual. But a lot of them go into extensive detail describing their ritual. They also write histories of the order, saying that it goes back to Godfrey Guillon. They write about the regulations of the order. So they make their order a very, very important material part of their discussion. Okay. So, why, uh, what do I glean from this? Well, I realized that the knighting ceremonial seemed to be really key to unlocking the meaning that they were trying to convey to their readers about why they were spiritual experts. Uh, why you should trust them, let's say, more than other Catholic authors. 
except for maybe the Franciscans. And I, and I think there are three elements um, that I touch upon in my chapter. One is the pilgrimage, which I think all of you are probably more familiar with in terms of its spiritual meaning. The second is this crusading past. And the third, then I want to talk about the relations with the friars. So just briefly with the pilgrimage, uh, any reader who read about the knighting ceremonial, I think one of the things they would immediately realized and understood is that by undertaking the pilgrimage, you were uh, de facto not only spiritually transformed, but you were invested with wisdom, spiritual wisdom. I mean, the truism of medieval pilgrimage treatises was that if you go to the Holy Land, you return a theologian. Right? The Holy Land was not just any secret space, it was these, the most important source. Hi, Amy. Uh, secondly, uh, so, the, so the pilgrimage, by the fact that they describe the ritual, uh, it, it, that in itself is very important because they're going to the Holy Land and they're not just being transformed in the Holy Land, they're actually being transformed at the foot of Christ's sepulcher. And that's the second part I want to get to. And this has to do with this crusading ritual, the crusading class of the ritual. When they describe the rituals, like the Menorah when I gave, What's very important to Bernard and the other knights is that you know that they were separated from the other pilgrims. So they're not ordinary pilgrims. They are going to be created into a new status, which is separate from that pilgrim, and that's the knight. So they're removed in the secret of night. They're, they're spied away by the Franciscan Custos. They have a secret ceremony at the foot of the sepulcher. They take an oath. They come out and they are physically redressed in the order of the knighthood. So they are a new spiritual creation. They are a soldier of Christ. What's very, very important to the knighting ceremonial is that the sword that they claim is they're being used, they're being knighted with, is the sword of God for you, the, the, you know, the famous French crusader. So, so, the, so first of all, we have the pilgrimage itself is spiritually transformative. Then they themselves go through a special transformation, which gives them, I will argue, a sense of a specific spiritual destiny and purpose, which is as defenders <clears> of <throat> the Holy Land. The third and final one, and this is where I'm going to wrap up um, and see what you think, the whole thing. What I find so interesting is that in their accounts, the, the officiation of the Franciscan is also very, very significant. And I think it really comes through in the fact that the Franciscans, uh, the Custos, is the one who officiates the entire ceremony. Well, in fact, that's a new right. Up until the 1490s, about 1494, uh, the right was actually performed by a member of the order. So it was knights, knighting knights. That, was, that went right back to the 1330s. So somehow in the 1490s, this starts to change. And the Franciscans start to play a much more um, uh, clearly defined administrative role. And then I argue that between the 1490s, they are playing, they, they acquire the right to officiate from the papacy. They acquire also uh, responsibility for formulating the oaths that are taken, for issuing the certificates that say you are a knight. You have to pay us first, but there's a certificate you can take home saying you're a knight. They also uh, will keep a registry of knights for the first time. We don't find it until 1566. But essentially from 1495, to especially 1516 and then continuing into 1560s, we find this increasing um, strengthening of the administrative ties between the custody and the order. And essentially the custody becomes the administrative home of the order. Because this order is an international group of pilgrims who really have no other head office in this period. So the only kind of coherency they have is through the pilgrimage ritual, which they all share, the, nighting, the, the pilgrimage, the knighting ritual, and the custody as an administrative home. These are the ties that really bind them. And uh, so I find this really interesting, and I just want to just push a little further. I think the Franciscans are playing a critical role in encouraging the knights and shaping them to think of themselves as spiritual leaders. Because what's also very interesting, the more I get into this, it's uh, well, the Franciscan treatises, if you start to notice, it's around the 1550s that Franciscan histories start talking a lot about the order. They start writing histories of the order in their own thing. Um, about a couple, of, um, but, uh, Bonifacio and Guza is probably the best known uh, in 1553, but also Francesco Quaresmio uh, in 1618. These are very important texts in which they start to talk about the order, talk about its history going back to Godfrey of Lyon, which is probably fictitious. 
And they cultivate this history, this crusading history, to build up uh, this legend that this is a order that is you know, um, dedicated to the Holy Land. So I think there's something going on in this period between 1490s and <coughs> especially the 1520s, where it became very meaningful both to the members of the order and the Franciscans to have a closer relationship, uh, one that served them both. Uh, and the short answer is I think that they needed each other because the pilgrimage in the Holy Land was, was they felt threatened. And, and the meaning of the Holy Land for them as a source of legitimacy was threatened. And so I find that they're very, um, they're, they're tightening their relations to validate each other's claims to spiritual authority. At the same time that the Franciscans are writing about the order, the members of the order are writing a lot about the Franciscans and their own treatises too. So it's just this dialogue that they're having back and forth about he, how each is a spiritual, uh, has a spiritual role. I threw a lot at you, um, and I did it sort of very quickly. Um, obviously, my chapter's a lot bigger. <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? Do you want me to see how it fits into the book project bigger? Do you want me to bring it back to that? No? No. Questions? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't see you. Uh, my question is about the, uh, right at the end when you're connecting the Franciscans to the Holy Order of the Holy Sepul uh, Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you were saying that they're kind of connected because of uh, this claim to spiritual authority. In I wonder to what degree also the de facto nature of the Franciscans of having to actually cooperate with both the Mamluks and the Ottomans. Mm -hmm and uh, the contrasted with the crusading nature of the order yeah. as somewhat legitimizing the Franciscans in pulling them away from the Ottomans uh, in mm, the Mamluks, yeah. right? That they might right. be envisioned as, you know, somewhat yes. like tainted by their relationship because yeah. they have to constantly, I mean, for instance, when the Jesuits start to come in in the 1590s mm -hmm. and 1600s, Franciscans are in Constantinople telling, you know, the Sultan and Grand Viziers, you can't let them in, right? You can't listen to, Henry IV, and you can't let them in, right? So they're constantly right. debating. For good reason, a lot. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so to what degree is it actually kind of not connecting them to the order, but pulling them away from kind of this, the, the Muslims, right? That, that's a really, really good question. And I, I, I'm wondering whether the question is the time period, because the, the, where I'm seeing the really profound changes taking place, though I think the relationship remains very powerful all the way through, is like, first of all, I think you're right. I think it does help legitimize them as representatives of the church. I think they are always walking this careful balancing act between saying, you know, Muslims, bad, Christians, good, you know, and so we have to, you know, the, the, un, the underlying crusading element never went away. Mm -hmm. But, the, but this, the time frame is kind of interesting because uh, it's where we're really seeing them being accused of being tainted he is exactly with the Jesuits and the Capuchins coming later. And that's much later. And so that's when they're really being forced to defend themselves because, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, they're being accused by the, you know, the Louis XIII and Louis XIV of essentially having spent too much time in the East, right? You need the new French orders which are purified. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good question. I think you're right. It's a constant balancing act. We do know from the work on Crusade, and a lot of you probably know this work um, in this period, in the long period, that it doesn't really go away. There's a constant sort of echo of Crusade from, especially, you know, wrapped up with the fall of Constantinople, when the Holy Land is taken in 15, 16, 15, 17, again. So this is a period where all of that is rolling. And I think that that's what I'm trying to tease is that all <coughs> different um, triggers that might explain what's going on for both of these men. Because this is happening, this tightening is happening even before the Reformation. I think the Reformation just sort of ramps it up mm. more. But I think that's an excellent point, and I think it's part of, part of the puzzle. Is that a satisfying? I don't know if that's a satisfying mm. answer. There was a couple of hands. Yeah. Um, I have a pretty uh, sort of small question, but um, I thought you had, maybe this is just slippage of speaking a little informally, but. You also call them a confraternity, and I yeah. was a little confused because to me, yeah. an order and a confraternity are pretty different things, uh, yeah. including in terms of social background of mm -hmm. the people who become members. I mean, mm -hmm. an order of knights obviously 
presume since they're noble standing, but a confraternity right. doesn't. So I was just curious if confraternity was mm -hmm. just a, a shortcut term or if there are actually confraternal aspects to it. And related to that, I was wondering, you said that the Franciscans basically served as the leading figures. I was wondering if at any point this order required a grand master of some sort. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a good sorry, question. Sorry, yeah. I a, yeah, yeah. The, the last question was nothing to do with anything particular except something you said at the very beginning, mm -hmm. that the custody was established by the king, the Angevin kings of Naples. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that too became part of the fight between France and Spain as to who really represented the kings of Naples after the end of the Andromans? Yeah, or? that's a really, I, I think that's all, there's, a, there's, there's definitely sort of a geopolitical element going on there. And, and with also with, um, uh, I, it could be playing into France at the time. It's, it seems to be like there's an ongoing competition, interestingly enough, between the kingdom of Aragon. And I mean, it's before the time I really focus on, so I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, but between the, the the, the crown of Aragon and the and the and the Angevin kings of Naples, like they're in competition for setting up a pilgrimage site there, and the and the king of Naples just happens to beat them. Uh, but then it gets complicated, and well, the Aragonese become the king of Naples. Well, exactly, so. right? Exactly. So they kind of acquire it anyway. And what's so interesting about that connection, and there's really wonderful scholarship on this by uh, Spanish scholars like Adam Beaver, who's done work on the Holy Land in the 16th century um, on Spanish, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, excuse me. Spanish um, uh, uh, patronage of the Holy Land, the custody, because they're the single most important patrons of the custody throughout the 15th and 16th and, and really into the 17th century. And in fact, my chapter three is really about how France is trying to muscle in and get rid of Spain out of the custody uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of that is that old relationship which the Spanish monarchy has used to, to really anchor its claims to being the, you know, most Catholic king and so forth. So this is all this is all part of the the bigger historical structure between these kingdoms. Absolutely. Do you want me to quickly backtrack and try and answer the first yeah, two? Yeah, please, yes, please. Um. The term confraternity is a tricky one, and, I, and it is problematic. But they, uh, I use it because first of all, they use that term, mm. so it is actually used, and they're consecrated one by the papacy. Uh, in the papacy, you start seeing legislation from the 15th century, but certainly into the early 16th century. This is sort of a series of decrees. But even before that, um, Jean de Gennes, uh, who's a really, really done a wonderful job on it, he says they're, they're, they're structured. If you look at the oaths they're taking, and I didn't get into that, it's structured as a confraternal organization. Now, is it a functioning confraternal one like any urban confraternity? Not at all, because they don't have uh, clearly structured uh, administrative roles. They don't have uh, a highly organized devotional life. It's sort of, you know, you commit yourself to personal prayer and devotion. But what they do have, and that's why I think it's its own unique sort of thing, is a, is a commitment to doing the pilgrimage, which is a rigorous rite. You know, that's a big commitment itself. Obviously, uh, the, the nighting ritual. And then this activity I'm seeing many of them involved in, in confraternities back home. I didn't get into this, but there's two in Paris that are very interesting. One at my Grand Couvent, the people I followed until then. Another one, they used to be attached to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Lyon, which I don't think is there anymore, the Church of the Holy... I think it was destroyed in the Revolution. I could have been But they had a very active hospice. It was established there in the 14th century. It might have been actually be a little bit earlier. So these were two local rival confraternities of the Holy Sepulchre. One was the arch confraternity, and one was the regular confraternity. Uh, and, and some of the men I, I wrote about, Nicole Bernard belonged to the Holy Sepulchre, uh, the church, and the um, Empire Red belonged to the... <coughs> But I, so what I'm saying is that they had a confraternal mentality. In terms of the diversity, very socially diverse. And in fact, it did become a problem. And in fact, they started to charge a lot more money by the end of the 17th century to try and get away, get uh, rid of the non-nobles, or at least trying to assume that you have to be pretty well off to do it. But of course, it probably it made it all the more exciting for the urban elite who want to join it. So essentially, what we see is a lot of nobility, a lot of members of noble through the 16th century up until 360. By the 17th century, the balance starts to shift. What we do see, which I think is so interesting as French historians, is how many French uh, counselors of state and representatives to the Levant are going through and becoming knights. So there is this order, I don't talk about it in this chapter so much, I sort of hint at it, but in my chapter three, I do start to get into the fact that there is a corresponding, though with the rise of French interest in the protectorate of the Holy Land, we also find French members of state joining this order as almost, I'm going to say, a rite of passage. That there's something happening in terms of the changing Catholic character of the state under the Bourbons. 
that makes this is a really, really valued demonstration of the, the Catholicity. Um, I can't prove it, but what I try to do is build up layers of evidence to at least make a case for it, if that makes any sense. And they can marry, presumably. Oh, yes, they're, they're mostly laymen. We do have a couple of priests. We do have a couple of Protestants and, and Maronites as well. So we do have, there is some, there is legitimate, you know, there, you know, there are two Protestant uh, authors of Pilgrimage Treatises, George Sandis, uh, probably not an Englishman, and uh, Leonard Rowe, a German, who both criticize the, the they, they name it, they name the order, and they say, these men, they're in Jerusalem, they're not really, <laughs> they're not really a devotional society. You can pay, as long as you pay this amount of money, you can be a member. But I, I think the fact that they're signaled, singled out is kind of interesting too, because I think they also recognize that maybe, I mean, these are also the, some of the same men who are writing treatises that are challenging their views, so maybe it was a sign of respect. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll come to you next. I think you were first, actually. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted you to talk about um, the Franciscan order as a sort of object of historical research because oh, okay. uh, I, I was staying in India, and so we read only about the Jesuits and even mm -hmm. about the Jesuits. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's only now that I see that some people, some scholars, are being interested in the Franciscans. So how how did that come about? And secondly, there's another question which I hope is uh, related. Uh, you spoke about the Franciscan order as a global order. Yes. So again, in my head, it's the Jesuits of the Netherlands. Yes. How are, that's, Jesuit, how, that's the effectiveness of Jesuit historiography. <laughs> 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 that's like brainwashing. Like, how, is it, <laughs> uh, how is it like global in the sense? Of, what is it? Is well, it like the, the pretty much everywhere the Jesuits are, the Franciscans are either already there uh, or are going as well. So first of all, globally, they're everywhere. Uh, certainly, talk about Spanish, the Atlantic world, and Franciscans, and were there from what I can't remember the first date, but early, early, early on. They're in China, I mean Asia, sorry, I can't remember doing that. Uh, they're all over the Levant from uh, within a few years. Francis of Assisi, um, you know, he went and preached supposedly to the Mamluk Sultan, uh, not the Mamluk Sultan, the, um, uh, I can't forget remember the, the Sultan at the time, the name, but in, in 1217 he went to join the Crusades, and Franciscans pretty much stayed there after that time. So if we're talking about even the Islamic regions of the Levant, it's the Franciscans, it's the Dominicans, it's um, the Carmelites to some extent, I think they're Augustinians, it's the Mexican orders. And they've been doing it a lot longer. Uh, so when the Jesuits come in, it's kind of, you know, they're latecomers, they're very effective. Johnny come late. <laughs> Johnny come late. They're using a lot of same strategies as well. I mean, you know, a lot of things that Jesuits do. And now, the Jesuits also are very innovative, and the Franciscans will adapt to them too. So it's very interesting. Uh, but that's what I would say they're a global order, and they think globally. And I'll give you another example about that. They saw the Holy Land as a global site of engagement. That's why it was so important to them. It's meaningful for them for two profound reasons. First of all, it's the center of Christendom, and Francis of Assisi for them what they consider literally Christ's um, surrogate. Like Christ, uh, he was their um, what do you call successor. So for them, it was natural that Francis would also go to the Holy Land, even though he didn't actually live in the Holy Land. But he, <laughs> that's another, sorry. But, the, but it was important that that was claimed as a Franciscan Holy Land. That's why my last chapter, one of the reasons why I think the custody becomes a ju jurisdictional, uh, there's intense jurisdictional conflict with the Franciscans, is that they're reforming, they think they should go to the Holy Land. I think that that's a, a, a site uh, that's important to their identity for uh, making contact with, with Francis. Uh, it's very important to them on a whole host of reasons, but it's ideological as well. The other, it's a global site of pilgrimage. So if you want to reach the world, Jerusalem is a fantastic place to do it because it's not just Christians going there. So I think that um, if you think of Holy Land in this period as it becoming a, you know, one of the things I argue in, in my book. Is what I'm arguing is that the Holy Land takes on new importance for, for Catholics in this period because of these profound changes that are embattling the church in different ways. Um, but I think one of the most important to my mind is I think it becomes a really, really powerful symbol that is kind of a way of, of uh, responding to Protestant uh, reification of the text as the word. I think the Holy Land is a really, really powerful symbol of Christ's authority because it is Christ, if you believe it. And that is, it is the material containment of Christ. It's a living, sacred history. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way I think about it. And, and the historiographical interest in the order, uh, mm. is it because the Jesuits had a better archival oh. system? Mm -hmm. So we, we, mm -hmm. 
So, so it's a well-developed body of work mm -hmm. on the Jesuits, right? And you see that the, the kind of writings that the Franciscans did are kind of similar. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and so, I, I think, uh, what you're asking is why have the Jesuits become the face of early modern missions? Yes, so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, they are excellent historians. Um, they, they've taken history writing seriously from this period. This is the period where they're writing excellent histories, right? The earliest days of the order. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's something to be very proud of. Uh, it's misrepresenting the history of mission to some extent because they're not the face of the missions entirely, but they're very important, right? Uh, so, I think that all I can say is it's just very effective historiography. And they were very effective missionaries and they were very good at cultivating people in power. But I think keeping a, a really good archive was clearly a source of power. The Franciscans are much more dispersed. They're not as good at packaging themselves that way. They wrote a lot of histories, but they tend to be not as um, systematic histories in many ways. I, I don't know how to explain it, because I've got lots of histories written by my friars, uh, but they're not the same as what the Jesuits are doing. So maybe you could answer that question. I may cite yeah. Bennett Hill, who was an old Benedictine colleague of ours. I once asked him, if there was any significant trove of Franciscan theology, and he snorted and said, Bonaventure was the last Franciscan who knew how to read and write. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I've heard that. I know, I know it's not true. <laughs> oh, but no, but there is some truth in that, in terms of, but, but then when you think about the most, uh, the most influential uh, Franciscan scholar, um, the scholastic thinker of the 15th century, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Scotus, Dun Scotus, I mean, certainly University of Paris, which I worked on, Franciscan. Uh, William Ockham. So we had a few. My people. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Amy started to defend the, the Dominicans. I was just going to say, they're all over. It's against the Jesuits. They're fighting heresy. It's like those Jesuits come along and just you know. take, all take all the credit. Take all the credit. All right, so I wanted to go on the back. Well, all right, so we'll go to you and then we'll go to the Middle Eastern. We can I know. I know. You want to hear from that? Oh, great. So I want to get because I know you're going to I'm hoping you're going to ask. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, right behind you, Paul. Oh, yes. oh yeah. yeah. Well, I was very excited. I had two small questions. One is, um, which may be a bit uh, basic for this crowd, if everyone knows more. But I was wondering, on the topic of the other orders which were around, mm -hmm. uh, was there like a competition for who would get this concession to administer <coughs> Jerusalem? Thank you and very who, much. Who I completely skipped over that. Um, I think first. This is the period where we're going to have intense contestation because the Franciscans actually have a monopoly over pastoral care virtually. I mean, there are there are pockets where uh, during the 16th century and earlier where like, a little Benedictine community allowed here, or uh, the Jesuits in the uh, 1590s are some example. These are very small. Most of these missions are two, three people. Uh, but really, the Franciscans have uh, juridical authority and uh, over the they. they until the, Je the Capuchins and the Jesuits and then the Carmelites are allowed in after 1622 by the Congregation, the Franciscans had uh, sole jurisdiction over all the altars and the holy places that were under um, Catholic authority, which is extensive and includes the ones, uh, some of the ones in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre, Church of the and some others. Uh, but they also had, and, the, uh, and, and frankly, the Jesuits and the Capuchins will never get in. They'll never get in. That's the one thing they'll never get into. But they also have pastoral responsibilities with the merchants in the port cities. Uh, and they're also managing pilgrims who are coming through. So essentially, any traveling Catholic is going to be working with the, um, the, and under the spiritual jurisdiction of the Franciscans until 1622, more or less. And then that's when it all starts to break apart. What happens in the end is a negotiation settlement where some Capuchins and Jesuit communities are allowed to establish in the port cities. Uh, and this sets off a century of more centuries of rivalry. What's interesting is who's still standing today? Let me ask you that. <clears throat> who's still there? Well, you said the Franciscans are still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They yeah. somehow outlasted <laughs> them all. Uh, but yeah, but but it went on for centuries. So this rivalry and the congregation, the records in the congregation is probably are fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic on these disputes because <coughs> the, it was a very smart body. It set itself up as a mediating body. And that was one way you could actually exercise more control. Um, so, so this is the period with the 17th century is when it all starts to fissure amongst the Catholic traditions. Okay. And the second part, which is related, is are there uh, sources or accounts from an Ottoman or Islamic perspective mm. about, you know, granting this privilege? Oh uh, yes. You know, yes. And in fact, uh, 
one of the things I didn't talk about um, is how extraordinarily indebted I am to Ottoman historians and other scholars who have been extraordinary colleagues to me. Uh, because this has been over 10 years of research on this. Over, I, I'm not even going to tell you exactly how long, because it's embarrassing. Um, but oh, I wanted to get back to the, the point I made earlier about, oh, let's see, because this is what I want to talk about to end up. Because I didn't get to talk about the custody as an Islamic institution. And I, I, you know, it's funny, I don't, for some reason, use the term, a lot of people like that term, oh, I did this again. I'm just going to go and use it here. <laughs> Three broad observations. Well, I, am I going the wrong way? Okay. Yes, I think I'm going to One of the things that, that's really important to my book, now I've I'm, now I'm broken the book, so I'm not even going to use it. One of the things that's really important that I, that I took from the scholarship that's been so extraordinarily important is to think about the custody from the start as a hybrid institution in which every uh, facet of Catholic religious engagement is actually legally constructed. Now, what's interesting is the Mamluks seem to have been the ones who really, really uh, pioneered this remarkable money-making uh, formula, which would also have political and spiritual consequences. So that, for example, the Basilica Solo Holy Sepulcher today has six different Christian traditions in it, each with different chapels. Well, they, most of them have owned those chapels back to even before the Franciscans came. And the Franciscans, when they came in the 14th century, uh, became rivals for some of the important chapels. And, and the chapels are in a, there's a hierarchy of sacrality, right? I mean, if you, if you can have, in the Holy Sepulcher, if you're going to have a chapel, you want to have the best location possible. So the crucifixion is a very good spot, right? Uh, the resurrection, also highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's a sacred geography that's intensely meaningful and familiar, by the way, to Catholics, to all Christians. Well, but Catholics are the stations of the cross. Uh, and so it's a geography that's already well established. It was, uh, and but it's le but it was legally constructed, right? Access was legally constructed. It was constructed, for example, I argue from the book that Islamic influence on Catholic worship is really important to understand because, for example, how many lamps you can have on your altars? Well, each lamp was a privilege. Uh, but do you have keys to open your chapel, the gate, or not? Who owns the keys is very important. And so the Mamluk, I think what they saw was that they saw the Christians fighting over the sacred space. And said, well, we're going to give you all access. You'll pay for the best spots. Like, you'll pay according to it. And we'll parcel out each privilege, which is a liturgical right. It's a point of access. These are all, it's all, so you're, so the religious life you have as a Catholic is now shaped by Islamic law from the 13th century, really much earlier, right? It was written back. But this law, I think, is just so formative. And I, don't, I can't say exactly when it happened, because I don't know that. But from what I can see, by the time you get to our period, this Catholic religious experience, which is then disseminated back through rituals to Europe, has already been shaped by Islamic culture to ways that we probably haven't given it credit. Right? And I find that very interesting. Another thing, this is a final point on that front, it's an interior worship, because you're not allowed to worship in public if you're Christian. So it's the interior spaces that are important. So the rare moments when you're allowed out in the streets also is you know, through pro the procession from the convent to the Holy Sepulchre for Palm Sunday. Or you know, Palm Sunday, when the, the, this was a cherished thing. The custos won permission to ride a donkey. What happened? Is a donkey an ass the same thing? It is the same thing, right? Into the city in, you know, on Palm Sunday. That was a very special privilege, because you were out in the open. You're going through the streets. Uh, so the Via Dolorosa to the stage, if you go down it, that's a public procession. But really, most of your worship is going to happen inside, right? It's in the chapels and the holy places. So just the material shaping of the faith, the liturgical rites are all designed, and it's a constant negotiation. That's where I'm coming from, anyway. Um, I don't know what you think of that. Thank you for being uh, Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so you have touched on things that, that I wanted to ask, too. but. Um, you know, you talk about the space itself as important, but mm -hmm. it's also a populated space. It's not mm -hmm. just authorities. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just Islamic authorities, right? Mm -hmm. You have local Christians. You sure. have all types of Christians. Mm -hmm. um, how do these interactions sort of affect, like, the identity of the knights? How does it affect oh, the, the, the ritual? Mm -hmm. I, 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 can't, I can honestly say that I couldn't tell you how it's shaping the knights. They're aware of them, and they talk about them in the Pilgrim Shoes, all the different Christian traditions. If you read in the Pilgrim Shoes at the time, one section usually is about, you're going to find all these different other Christians there, 
and then the Muslims and so forth. So I think that they're important. But most of these men are passing through. I think where it's really interesting to talk about the shit in them is the Franciscans, because they're all living there. They're having to engage, work together often. And one thing on this book, what I realized I didn't like about my book at the end is that it's structured around conflict. Now, it's mostly inter-Christian conflict. It's all, in fact, it's mostly. I mean, the Islamic is shaping everything. The Islamic context is shaping everything. But most of the conflict I'm talking is really between Christians, and in particular between Catholics. My last three chapters are all between Catholics. But my next book, which is going to be based on a lot of material that I haven't been able to use here, is actually going to talk about the ways that they try to articulate a place for themselves within Jerusalem and the Holy Land, with all these other communities. Because they were showing rituals. They were often in rituals together. So they were, on the one end, defining each other against one another. Mm -hmm. If you go on the board, this is the Holy Sepulchre. What's really interesting is how different the spaces look. You know when you walk into the Armenian Christian space, right? If you, yeah. So you've been there, right? Yeah. So, and you, when you go, do you notice the Franciscan space looks quite <coughs> modern? And that apparently they told me it was quite deliberate. They redid it in the 20s because they wanted to say, and they said we did it so that we would look modern, looking forward, and different from everybody else. <laughs> so they're very conscientiously articulating a religious culture that is oppositional on some level. Mm -hmm. But I think they're also doing it to find a place for themselves within together. So I think it's, I think we have to kind of, I think I need to shift my thinking because it's definitely not all about conflict. They have to work with the other communities. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. I do find, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing project. I will say you see lots of evidence of them together worshiping at the same time in the same rituals as well as evidence of conflict. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. I've got two questions. A short logistical question about doing research in Jerusalem oh. that students still doing archival research might appreciate. <laughs> and then a, a historical question. When you go to do research in a French archive, you know you're going to have to speak French, and you know they're going to speak French. Right. You go to an international archive in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and you're having a chin wag with Padre Cristoforo, mm -hmm. are you speaking Italian, Latin, Esperanto? Oh, yeah. what, what is the spoken language of the archive there? Well, you know, the nice thing about going to a uh, global pilgrimage site is that they speak a lot of languages. <laughs> they, each of them. Uh, very rarely do you find one that just... Now, the language, the official language there is Italian. Right? That's still the official... It was... I didn't mention this as well. It's an international community. But, in fact, the, the Venetians had a lock hold on in our period. They had 50% of the friars came from the Veneto and other parts of Italy, but mostly the Veneto. Uh, so that's an imperial history that's it's interesting in itself, right? But the, so to, to this day, Latin is the core language. Uh, but when I was there, it was interesting. So we spoke uh, Italian, but my Italian, honestly, is not good, even my work in it. Uh, most, a lot of French, hmm. not English. He didn't know English, so it was French no. and Italian. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but then the, uh, the head archivist, he was just the assistant archivist. The, the interesting thing about Padre Cristoforo, oh my gosh, I forgot about this. This is the best part of archival research. So fun. I was only allowed to go every day from quarter to nine to 12, and that's only if every day he gave me permission to come back the next day. Mm -hmm. So first of all, there was that. Because his job was to amass, to run the rites in the Holy Sepulchre. That was his job. That was his main job, assistant archivist. He just sat there uh, talking to me. Actually, I had a hard time getting my work done because there was a lot of storytelling going on. <laughs> But he would tell me stories about what was going on in the Holy Sepulchre, and he said, you know, the Armenians were not behaving well today. You know, <laughs> because when you go in there, those people haven't been there. Uh, the rituals are still really, really meaningful, and they're engaging in relations through ritual to this day. So that I remember being there, and I was in the Franciscan Chapel of the Revolution, and this, I think it's an Armenian priest, one of the Greek Orthodox, he came striding up to, there's, a, there's actually a legal boundary, um, and did the incense, the, did the, what's the censer? The censer. He started waving it very vigorously into the chapel, uh, the Franciscan chapel, and then walked away to his. I mean, if that isn't a rite of purification, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this is, uh, and there, we, we've had, you know, um, Israel every year at Easter is saying, you know, I mean, it's obviously serving some kind of political purpose, uh, accounts of fistfights between priests and so forth. I think that that, I don't want, think we ever need to reduce it to that kind of thing. There's a very rich ritual language happening here that we aren't all privileged to, I'm certainly not. But I do think that in terms of archival experience of talking to him, hearing about the rites today, and then being in the convent where they've been since 1558, and working on this extraordinary surviving source base, it was minimal, it was minimal compared to what they used to have, but it was still really, really important. So, and just frankly, just being in Jerusalem. If we talk about text, are the places we work on our texts, 
And uh, I didn't know, this is my ignorance, I didn't know until I got to Jerusalem how intimate a space it is. And when we talk about being closely people living on top of each other, uh, ch you know, churches, mosques, temples, all jostling amongst each other, different Christian communities, ten different Christian communities jostling amongst each other. Uh, it's a very intimate religious space, and I think that helps to explain the complexity of why the relations are so common. My, my other question has to do with the readership of these pilgrimage accounts. Oh, we'll right. The ten. Right. It, it wasn't clear how many were printed, how many were in manuscript. Yeah. I mean, every Catholic in Paris who had books, well, most of them, <laughs> would have travel accounts to the Holy yeah. Land. Many of them written by people who never went to the Holy Land. Um, <laughs> yes. But. Or copied somebody who did. Yeah. 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 I mean, they were all like that. Yeah. But. Um, I suspect very few had any of these pilgrimage accounts, which were much sound much more detailed uh, uh, about okay. Jerusalem. How did, mm -hmm. did non-Franciscans read them? How widely were they distributed? Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, so this is this is the whole another whole part I had to leave out, but it's in the chapter. Uh, but it, what I would say is this: first of all, we have to think about pilgrimage treatises changing by the 16th century in the ways that they're getting much more. They generally speaking, are getting much longer and more complex. <coughs> Um, so you have this, but you still have the simple handbooks, which are just guidebooks. Right? So they're different kinds, so that gets tricky. In terms of the ones that people will be familiar with, another thing I would say is that most pilgrimage treatises, whether, whenever they were published in this period, uh, we've got one edition. And it would have been very local. So it's, you're absolutely right. How widely did they circulate? It's not clear. What I can say is that with the ones that I've got here, the ten that I have, uh, all were published. Uh, in one edition, except Jean, Jean's Well Arts, which had multiple, I think Villemont had more than one, they had two. But what's interesting is that they cite one another. Were they published in Rome? What, where were they published? Oh, all over the place. Um, oh gosh, oh, why do you ask me something that I can't remember all the places? All right. they're all, they're, 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 often they're local, right? Often yeah. they're, they'll publish them if they're from a little town, like a, a Pizzetti, I think he published, he's from Bergamo. Uh, I think he publishes in Bergamo, so I'll, I'll, you know, I need to go and double check on that. But the, I think what we need to realize about them is that um, a lot of these are being published, most of them only in one edition, probably the readership, hard to gauge. But what's interesting is whoever's writing them is reading other pilgrimage treatises. <laughs> what's also interesting, and I think this is a change for the 16th century, is that I think most people are going. Because increasingly the authority of the text rests on whether you go or not. And that's really going back to my part, that being in the Holy Land, I think is actually getting more meaningful. I don't want to say more meaningful, but it is, to be there is meaningful. It is powerful. And that's why the French state wants to have jurisdiction there. That's why he wants to send in French priests, French missionaries. That's why the papacy wants to increase the, evangel the evangelization population, so more priests mm -hmm. around. Being there, having the altars, it's meaningful. I just got off track, didn't I? I'm sorry. I get going. But I don't, I mean, but that's an excellent question. I mean, most of these are in one edition. But they're clearly read, and the Franciscans are reading them and quoting, like they're all, there's a, there's a dialogue happening. So I have a French question. Oh, okay. All right, so you talked about Joe for your meal. Yes. How important he is to all this. Yes. He's also very important in Guy's family propaganda. Do the two things in the second half of the this is where Jim always reminds me that I've, I've lost my credentials as a French historian. Sure. Uh, because it's true. I feel like the world's, I feel like a fraud because like, France is such an important part of my story space. That was the other thing I was going to point out, uh, obviously, uh, before I try to avoid uh, answering Jim's question. Uh, first He's already well, started. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, first of all, here's a question that you can answer because you know all of this. Is the Duc de Nevers, is that part of the Guise branch by 1650? 16 can no, but he's married to the widow. Okay, that's, so I think we've got a connection because <sighs> this is very interesting. And so this my is this the Midis Chrétien? Yes. Right, with Nevers and Père Joseph? Yes, okay, so you know about this. Yes. So, okay, so this is, so my <laughs> order that is now relevant again. Because, uh, <laughs> because in... I was going to ask you about that, too. I'm yeah. curious if they're tied into the news clip. <laughs> well, I don't know if there's... Well, they are, in the sense that the, what, the, what, what seems to be happening is that both in France, there's this resurgence of chivalric, interest in chivalric. Mm -hmm. um, the papacy also is very interested 
in encouraging these, these civil orders. It, it, that's why it's promoting the order of all this order. In 1558, there's a very serious effort, it seems, to actually get the order of the civil court up and running as a real crusading order uh, through negotiations between the papacy and Philip II of Spain. I found these documents in Simancas, the royal mm -hmm. in Simancas, and they're extraordinary. Nothing happened with them, right? But it was part of a negotiation that was obviously part of the bigger political treatise, which I guess is, um, is it Count of Cambrésis, or which one would it be, 1558? There was some conflict I should know about, but I've forgotten. But the peace, 1558. It's related to whatever the, whatever Spain and the Holy League. Yeah. Holy yeah. League. Um, sorry, I should know that. Uh, but what's interesting, so there was a real effort to get this, which is really just a confraternal society with some nobles, like definitely has nobles, but a lot of merchants, and you know, they don't have horses necessarily ready to go anymore. But they um, had a meeting in Dorstadt. Uh, they brought all these Dutch knights. It seemed to be the Dutch knights behind it for some reason. And they had a meeting on how to make it a, a functioning uh, chivalric order. Uh, um, and, the, and then Philip II would be the Grand Master. So that didn't work out, but then in 1615, there's another attempt, and this time the Duc de Nevers was, was pushing to become the Grand Master of the Order. There's another attempt to get it up and running. And that seemed to have even less success. At least the doorstop they had an advertisement in the newspaper. Um, so that's all I know about that, and I do find, that I think there, there are many more connections. Are you tying the propaganda fear into this sort of, let's say, Venice, England, France, Bellarmine, 1606 to 1615, where there's all this fighting about the relationship between secular and paper power. Is propaganda fide in your view tied well, into that in a certain way? Well, it is and it is and it isn't. I'm not going there with that. Um, for, firstly, because I'm, I, I'm overwhelmed by what I have. Uh, but secondly, because it's not formed until 1622. But there is a predic uh, precursor called the Clementine. Which was formed around uh, 16, which was functioning from till 1604. Mm -hmm. So, so there may be a connection. I have been talking about it more. There could be that connection. What I'm finding, I think, it's very interesting as an arm of a papal government that is now dealing with all these new empires that have an enormous amount of influence over the church globally. Mm -hmm. And how can it reassert itself? So, is it about Bellarmine's project? I'd have to look into it. I, I wouldn't say for sure. I've been looking at it more from on the ground. But also is a little bit, because Bafferini, who was the nuncio in Paris when all this was happening, okay. he doesn't become Pope until, what, 1624? Oh, so, so he's he, he, um, yeah. So he's really a key figure in this. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because the, the, in fact, the early years of the congregation are pivotal. So I'm going to have to look into that. It's a good thing I'm writing that chapter now. So I'll, I'll look into it. This is what Jim always did. Jim and Mac, I can count to uh, undermine my the, the central parts of my argument. So <laughs> this is so, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I have also like a related like a French question. Yes. So uh, you said that it's like a pilgrimage, like the account or text is like uh, the turning point is 1570, right? So it's a bit after the 1570. It's uh, previously it's like a devotional text is like many, but it's like uh, changed to the like uh, maybe polemics. maybe polemics, right? Yeah, yeah. But so so in my mind it's like uh, so your time span is like uh, from 1570 mm -hmm. to 1700. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like uh, so I'm curious about that. It's like uh, at the, at least in France, is uh, actually it's like after the like. Uh, 16, like 10, or like maybe after the like eating of the Nazis, like uh, the changes, mm -hmm. like uh, polemics, is a uh, even if like uh, it is like a religious polemic, but it's like uh, is there any possibility is related to the, to the like uh, political like implication? Is like uh, is mm -hmm. real like a volatile issue, right? So it's right. because it's a uh, they right. need to be careful about like what they say because it's a uh, mm -hmm. there is a, some extent is uh, related to, the, to like a political question. Is a uh, mm -hmm. the Parliament of Paris is uh, like a uh, Mm. It's a previously it's a bond like a uh, foreign order is like a uh, text or like a political text something like that. Mm -hmm. So so mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. Is a uh, cool. in there like a por the pilgrimage text? Is is there any like uh, mm -hmm. in France is uh, like a political like the implication something like that? So that's a really good question. You know, so I'm, I've got the five the five texts of the the French knights that are very interesting. Uh, certainly two of them directly sort of evoke the wars of religion as, as um, part of their, you know, there is part of their way they're framing it. Antoine Regnault is very interesting. He actually went to the pilgrimage in 1549, but he didn't write his book and published until 1573. And he does talk about uh, the struggles and about uh, 
the importance, and he's the one who actually, oh, I didn't, I didn't give it to you. I have this wonderful devotional song that he wrote and put in his text, and it's, it's a mixture of devotional and militaristic elements. But it's essentially, I, I, he's speaking directly of the wars of religion without talking about the wars of religion, I think. I think that's very much the context. It's righteous Christians, Catholics will triumph. You know, it's that thing. Uh, and his devotional song is about, you know, just work with the order. The order will help interpret this for you and will lead to the reconquest of, you know, um, and the, you know the, the spread of Christianity. So I would say that, is it political? I think on some level, what's going on behind them in Europe must be really important. Jean, Jean Zouillard in the Netherlands uh, very much tackles uh, um, religious controversy head on. And I think it's because those two in particular seem to be living in really, really contested sites. Uh, the Italians less so, um, and, and the Spanish less so. And I think it's because these were safer religious zones, so it wasn't as immediate. Um, that's just a theory. Um, but I wouldn't say it's overt in the way, uh, I don't know that they're protecting themselves from any kind of controversy. They're writing a little bit earlier, I think, in that case. Uh, so it's a good question. I just can't see it. You know, these are laymen. Uh, so I think their texts have got a different audience to some extent. Is that helpful? Good more questions. questions from the outfield back there? I'm curious, I'm That's curious. what it used to be called when I was a uh, sports writer. Right? The, main, the main desk and the people like me who wrote little stories about high school basketball player or high school games were out in the back and we were called the outfit. That's so where that term sort of comes from. Okay. Uh, you said that if we were curious about it, you could talk more about the role of the wars of religion and the development of the bourbon and this transformation and trying to take over. Uh, now you're just trying to get me. Do you ever work this a glass of wine after she answers this question? Remember, you're sick and tired of the wars of religion. <laughs> Or I'll just take Nathan aside. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm dealing with a similar question. I'm dealing with a similar question in my dissertation. Can you answer that in three minutes? Oh my, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Essentially, it's chapter three. Uh, but is it, I think the short answer, to my mind, uh, there's a very interesting symbiosis between French interest and pressing this uh, role, which didn't exist before, called protector of the holy well, places. Um, and getting a, a officially in 1604. There was a, and I want to say that they, they had, the Ottomans had made privileges, there was privileges in Islamic relations with other cultures to have a role protecting your, your, your Christians, you know, in your community. And certainly the Holy Land, you know, consuls were given the right to protect their pilgrims. Um, but what's interesting is France pushes for a much more expansive rule over the course of the 17th century. And really, 1604 is a very important marker. 1673 is a very, very important renegotiation of the capitulations. Uh, but what I'm arguing is that um, one of the many elements going on is that you've got a bourbon monarchy from, you know, you've got Henry the, Henry the Fourth ascending the throne, this troubled religious context, political context. And the question is, how do they rebuild their authority? And they do it in many ways. But I think one way that becomes useful is to construct their engagement in the, in the Levant and the Holy Land in particular as a way of selling themselves as a Catholic power. You can see how that would be useful for Henry IV to begin with. But I think it becomes extremely important to the Louis XIII and Louis XIV as well. Very important. They talk about it all the time. It's one of the advice, um, uh, it's one of the instructions given to their ambassadors every single time you go protect. Uh, your, your job when you're an ambassador is to press, uh, is to protect all Catholics, and increasingly they're all Christians. So there's an expansion of the rule. Now, the real target in many cases is not only home, but Spain. So there's also, the Holy Land becomes a very interesting site of imperial rivalry. Um, and uh, the Franciscans are caught in the middle because the, Spain pays <laughs> for a lot. Uh, it's the single biggest blunder, and in fact, Spain will bring them to the new world. I've got a colleague who works on um, alms collecting in, in uh, and mementos in uh, the new world, and so, and and the base of operations is the custody. The custody has all of the alms collectors, the commissariats going in and out. Spain's procurer is in charge of all the financing. I've got a very funny episode. This is getting over three minutes, but this last time. Uh, where the Spanish procurator, the, the, the Italians, because there's all this national rivalry between the three big faces, the Italians, the French, the French, he, uh, the Italian uh, Custos accuses the Spanish procurator of not letting him into the cellar. 
because he controlled the keys to, <laughs> to I guess, everything, all the provisions, all the finances. But what's going on symbolically, there's an economic component, there's, um, I should be, I'm going to talk about it in, in my other project, um, I'm building a discussion of it as a uh, global commerce and pilgrimage mementos and alms collecting that's, that hasn't been, that goes all the way from the Holy Land to Europe, all the way to Atlantic Road. But what's also interesting is just ideologically, you've got these two new empires, really, who are turning to the Holy Land, they're turning to their Catholic heritage of their, their countries to try and define the role for themselves as great powers as well. So the religious, I think it provides further support for thinking about early modern empires as constructed on the backs of, uh, of in which religion, religion is very important to shaping their identity. 